Hello and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches. I'm Teniola Shobowale. On the program this week, we focus on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. With nearly a million people in Ukraine fleeing to neighboring countries, the United Nations estimates that up to 4 million people overall may try to leave Ukraine because of the Russian invasion. The United Nations has launched an emergency appeal for $1.7 billion to provide urgent humanitarian aid to people caught up in the Russian invasion and for the refugees fleeing the violence. The EU has also relaxed its rules on refugees and says its member states will welcome the refugees with open arms. Ukrainian refugees are crossing the borders to neighboring countries to the west, such as Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary and Moldova. On Monday, the UN said that more than 600,000 people had entered these countries from Ukraine. At least 600,000 people fled Ukraine in the past five days following the start of military operations and the escalation in hostilities. There are also an estimated 470,000 third country nationals in Ukraine, including a large number of overseas students and labor migrants. At this rate, the situation looks set to become Europe's largest refugee crisis this century, and UNHCR is mobilizing resources to respond as quickly and effectively as possible. Poland has so far taken in over 400,000 refugees, according to the UN. The Polish government says a further 50,000 are arriving every day. The country is also preparing a medical train to transport wounded Ukrainians and has drawn up a list of 1,230 hospitals to send them to. But crossing the border is challenging. Many people waited for up to 60 hours in freezing weather and in queues of up to 15 kilometers long. To be honest. So when we started our line, our queue, uh, three days, almost three days ago, it was okay. People were starting like, to be uh, agitated slowly while they're getting uh, tired. So as the time passes, it's more and more difficult for people to stay uh, and keep uh, quiet and calm. So it's getting tired. 40 kilometers walking. <laughs> I know how the situation is. It's not funny. It's not that easy. It's so hard. But somehow we survived with our pets. We are having a rabbit. We are having a cat. We have 10 people. We are a 10 people group. A lot of people are still waiting there without food, without a lot of things. That's it. Many have had to scramble to board trains, taking them out of Ukrainian cities. It's a sad journey because we are uh, coming from, from Dnipro. Uh, now it's more or less quiet, but sooner or later everything could come. So uh, me and my kids and my mom, we are going to travel to Poland first. I don't know which way now we're going to try because it's really hard to do now. And then we're going to go to Germany. So. We are trying to go to Poland via the train. We were I obviously cannot go because I am a man, but I am escorting my women and my children to Poland via train. With the Polish routes too crowded, most refugees fleeing Ukraine are now heading to Romania and other neighboring countries. We, we were about five days. Five days, we, we wait for about three days to get to the Polish border from Kiev, and that's about eight hours drive. So we were three days. It was impossible. Roads totally packed and uh, block posts. It's like, uh, you know, military things too. So it's, it's very difficult, yeah. Uh, it was actually really difficult because uh, it was re the train was really crowded. A lot of people wants to leave because in Ukraine, I was in Kharkov, everybody like, uh, everything was bombarded. We couldn't like stay uh, calm at our places. The metro even also was like uh, bombarded, I heard in the center. But then, yeah, well, later we took the train and uh, we left. Oh, it was really crowded with people, like, uh, it was a mess. But I, I, I can understand because everybody is stressed and everybody is, like, uh, wants to leave because the situation is really difficult. The United States says Russia's invasion is resulting in a human rights and humanitarian catastrophe. This is a pivotal moment for the world and a pivotal moment for the UN Human Rights Council. 
Russia's brutal, unprovoked war on Ukraine, a sovereign, democratic, and peaceful nation, is, re is resulting in a human rights and humanitarian catastrophe. We sent an urgent letter to High Commissioner Bachelet regarding credible information we obtained indicating that the Kremlin was planning systematic human rights abuses in the aftermath of its invasion. To the Russian government and Russian military personnel involved in this invasion, the world is watching. The United States is supporting all efforts to identify and document human rights abuses or violations of international humanitarian law. We will work to ensure that perpetrators are held to account. It's time for the Human Rights Council to act. We cannot ignore reality. Meanwhile, the United Nations says it is trying to help internally displaced people, but the war is making it unsafe for aid workers to travel around Ukraine. UNICEF says thousands and thousands of children in Ukraine are at risk of dying in the conflict. We know children have been killed. We know that thousands and thousands are at risk. And we know that, that more children gut-wrenchingly are going to die or, or be injured in this unless fighting ends. And right now we see an escalation across those cities. So we are going to send, so that, that, that's, that's part of that. We are going to see more children separated from families, more fathers handing children across the border guards in Poland. Uh, and I wish I had more numbers and we're seeking them, but we don't. But, you know, there are orphanages. There are tens of thousands of children in orphanages in, in Ukraine. Many of those in these major cities, which are under uh, bombardment right now. Uh, it's a very real degree of, of trauma. It, it's, it, the train station behind me just almost echoes uh, with, with tears as families are separating. Fathers are trying to explain to their seven-year-old daughters where, why dad is leaving and why they're going to a country they've not heard of. The UN estimates that 12 million people inside Ukraine will need relief and protection, while more than 4 million refugees may need protection and assistance in neighboring countries in the coming months. Meanwhile, as refugees flee Ukraine, more reports of mistreatment by Ukrainian border guards continue to come to light. Nigerian students who have successfully crossed from Ukraine to neighboring countries have been speaking on their experience. A number of them who spoke to Channel's television spoke about their experience reaching border points and finally escaping the war in Ukraine. Out of the hundreds of thousands of people waiting at various border points surrounding Ukraine, a number of Nigerian students have been able to cross the border into various countries. We have been following the story of Belumi and her friends, students at Venezia National Medical University, who had to flee attacks by Russian forces. Thankfully, they've made it to the Romanian capital, Bucharest, all thanks to the Romanian officials and officials from the Nigerian mission there. Once you enter the Ukrainian border, I mean, like you are good to go. Because the Romanian border didn't give us stress at all. When we entered there, they picked us up. Then we were able to see the consular that um, showed us where to go to. They were really nice. Romanians. Both, yeah. both Romanians and the Nigerian government in Romania, Romania, they are really nice. They took yeah. care of us, put us in a bus, yeah. some of us in hotels, and then they paid everything. We didn't spend a dime. Other Nigerian students, such as Jessica, Olaleye, and Aziz, recount stories of luck and friendship that ease the hardship faced in trying to leave Ukraine. The fact that I just wanted to get out, I was like, I could do it. If I got tired, I sat down. I didn't even know it was 12 hours till I sat down and I checked my phone. They had been walking for 12 hours. And I hadn't even gotten to the border yet. I had to sleep and start all over again. And the thing that was so painful the most, even talking right now, is the fact that even when I saw a boss, going straight from where I was at that moment to get to the Polish border. The officials told me only Ukrainians. I said I was pregnant. I said everything. I begged, I cried. They looked me in the face and said, no internationals, just Ukrainians. Literally a cat got on board. We saw that the soldiers in charge of the border did not care. They just, they only cared for organization. So we found a way to make sure that the, uh, the crowd was organized, and then we used it to our advantage to push our people through. 
at the end of the day, our people were able to pass through the border in a, in a space of about 10 hours. Many Nigerians were making the inaugural evacuation flight on Wednesday. As assured by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jeff Onyama, it goes without saying that given the circumstances, many look forward to being as far away as possible from the conflict in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has prompted huge financial sanctions against Russia. The escalating list of measures is starting to severely impact the country's economy and Ukraine's allies are warning of more measures to come. Moscow residents stood in long queues for ATMs on Tuesday as Western sanctions over Russia's invasion of Ukraine hit residents on the street. People rushed to withdraw cash after the Russian ruble hit record lows, losing a third of its value so far this year. We are worried that soon ATMs will run out of cash. No one knows what to think. That is why there's a long queue here. The sanctions in Russia range from curbing the central bank's ability to use its gold and foreign exchange reserves to excluding big Russian banks from international financial markets. Western nations have warned of more sanctions in the coming days. We are resolved to continue imposing massive costs on Russia. Costs that will further isolate Russia from the international financial system and our economies. In coordination with President Biden, President Macron, Bundeskanzler Scholz and Prime Minister Draghi, as well as Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Johnson, we considered a significant tightening of our international response. The European Union and its partners are working to cripple Putin's ability to finance his war machine. We will paralyze the assets of Russia's central bank. This will freeze its transactions, and it will made it impossible for the central bank to liquidate assets. Well, we're very clear that there are severe costs being put in place for this illegal invasion of Ukraine. That is why we are putting in place the severest package of sanctions uh, the UK has ever put, put in its history, uh, including freezing bank assets, cutting Russia off from vast parts of the SWIFT system, uh, targeting companies, targeting oligarchs, banning flights. Uh, banning vessels from Russia. And we're working in concert with our G7 allies and other countries around the world. That's over 50% of the global economy. We were very clear there would be severe costs. We're imposing those severe costs. Together. During his first State of the Union address on Tuesday, US President Joe Biden said Russian President Vladimir Putin has no idea what's coming as a result of economic sanctions imposed. Together, along with our allies, we are right now enforcing powerful economic sanctions. We're cutting off Russia's largest banks in the international financial system, preventing Russia's central bank from defending the Russian ruble, ruble, making Putin's $630 billion war fund worthless. We're choking Russia's access. We're choking Russia's access to technology that will sap its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. In response to mounting Western sanctions, Russian President Vladimir Putin on Sunday raised the threats of nuclear war. Citing aggressive statements by NATO leaders and economic sanctions against Moscow, President Putin ordered his military command to put Russia's deterrence forces, a reference to units which include nuclear arms, on high alert. As you can see, not only do Western countries take on friendly measures against our country in the economic dimension, I mean the illegal sanctions that everyone knows about very well, but also the top officials of leading NATO countries allow themselves to make aggressive statements with regards to our country. That is why I ordered the Defense Minister and Chief of the General Staff to put the Russian Army Deterrence Forces on high combat alert. The Russian president has also ordered a ban on foreign exchange loans and bank transfers by Russian residents to outside of Russia from March the 1st in retaliation for economic sanctions imposed on Moscow by the West. The Kremlin says Western sanctions will never make Russia change its position on Ukraine. When Foreign Dispatches returns in just a moment, thousands of people in several cities across the globe take part in anti-war protests. Please stay with us. 
Thanks for staying with us on the program. Over the past week, people around the world have voiced their condemnation of the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. Protesters marched in streets and city squares, holding vigils and rallies supporting Ukraine and opposing the war. Many have also called on their government to do more. Let's take a look. Russia, go home. Protesters across the world, many visibly emotional, continue to come out in large numbers to show solidarity with Ukrainians. They all have one message, stop the war. In Greece, many had tears in their eyes as the Ukrainian national anthem played. 55-year-old Nelia, whose 25-year-old daughter lives in the northeast area of Sumy, says she feels like she's living in a horror film. My, I feel myself like I live some hor, hor, in horror film, what I can say. My daughter, my daughter now in Sumy region, they are circled with the Russian army. Every day they have bombing from two to three times. They, they go to shelter. I can't go there. I can't help her. I just say, and he, she can't come here now. And I just, like some stupid... What I guess, I, I just sit every day on the sofa and I watch the news and I have my telephone in my hand and I just wait her to come here. Students in a Polish town which has been a major convergence point for Ukrainian refugees have also taken to the streets, calling for an end to the Russian invasion. They deserve to be given a place at our school because they are running from war. It's not their fault that they're running from war because it, they didn't ask for this. They didn't ask to be attacked. They didn't ask to lose their homes, their lives, their school. So we should give them the space to live. We should give them everything to survive, everything they need, food, shelter, whatever they need, because they are people just like us. Hundreds of lawmakers, Ukrainian and Russian protesters, gathered on the steps of the EU parliament in Brussels on Tuesday in a show of solidarity after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And you will find Europe. We will help with weapons, with aid, with logistics, with massive sanctions, and we will do whatever it takes to hold aggressors to account. Because the age of dictators and autocrats is over. <laughs> President Putin, Alexander Lukashenko, all the oligarchs who bankroll them will be held accountable for waging war in peaceful Europe. So long live Ukraine, long live Europe, Slava Ukraini. We need all support. We need like NATO to protect our sky because we can fight. I know my people, they will resist till the very last person there. People there ready to fight for their land, for their, for their country and for their homes. And we, because we can give the fight on the land, but unfortunately they are bombing cities. And this is what not, we are not able to do. Russia is huge, but Ukraine is a great country. Please help us. We have to do something. This happens from our name. And this is not from my name. This war is not from my name. It destroys peace in Europe. It destroys Ukraine and it destroys Russia as well. It's. I'm, I'm shocked, I'm ashamed, I'm very, very, I don't know, I, I, I've got no words. I just want this over, I want this to stop immediately. My message to Ukrainian people, first of all, and to everyone. I am Russian, I'm from Russia. I am against this war, I'm against Putin. He made this war possible and um, it's not Russian people against Ukrainians, it's Putin and everyone around him, they're against Ukraine. In Israel, several dozen Israelis staged a demonstration in support of Ukraine outside the country's parliament. Participants waved Ukrainian flags, held signs that read, no war, and called on the Israeli government to take action in support of Ukraine, including providing it with the Iron Dome missile defense system.
we really need the world to step in because it's not just an attack against Ukraine, it is an attack on the whole free world. And we, we need all the support we can get. In Georgia, protesters held a candlelight vigil in solidarity with Ukrainians. I'm here to support Ukraine and their people who are right now fighting a war versus Vladimir Putin and versus Russia. And secondly, I'm going to protest the regime of Vladimir Putin and Russia. Uh, I want the Ukrainians to know that we are here, all of these people are with them and Slava Ukraini. I'm here because I'm not supporting our government and I think uh, Vladimir Putin did so many crimes uh, during so many years uh, and I hope uh, it will finish uh, anytime. In the United States, protesters have also taken to the streets across the country. We are Ukrainians living in New York and we are desperate to ask people to help Ukraine to fight because they are just alone. They are supporting but actually not supporting. We want real support country because they are weak, it's a small country, we never wanted war and we have our relatives, our mothers children and grandchildren there. I'm here because my friends in Ukraine are fighting and dying for their homeland amid the most destructive, nonsensical, evil invasion since the end of World War II. Canadians have also called for peace and for the government to do more. They're of course scary and they don't know what's going to happen like tomorrow. They just don't know like when it's going to happen and when Putin is going to start stop like attacking Ukraine. It's very hard to, for us to stay in Canada and understand that nobody can stop him. I was checking the news and I was always in touch with my family because uh, I was so scared that something might happen to them. It's just, it's so bad. The sales of Australia's iconic Sydney Opera House and the country's parliaments in Canberra were lit up in blue and yellow on Monday to show solidarity with Ukraine. The cast of Don Carlos sang the Ukrainian national anthem before their performance at the Metropolitan Opera in New York on Monday. During the tribute, Ukrainian cast member Vlad Buyaisky was sent to stage. More than a hundred diplomats from some 40 countries walked out of a speech by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov at the United Nations in Geneva as a protest against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Tuesday's boycott by envoys from the European Union, the United States and the United Kingdom, Japan and others left only a few diplomats in the room. We will fight until the end and we will win. We feel your support. We greatly appreciate all, uh, all your support. And uh, the, the steps that we have taken today in International Geneva send a very strong signal to the Russian Federation that such actions are not acceptable, uh, are not tolerated in the 21st century. We know what Mr. Lavrov is going to say. He's been, he's been saying it before. Um, the door has been open to diplomacy for a long time and Russia's chosen not to take on it. They have made their choice. They've, they've launched this unprovoked and premeditated attack. Uh, and the world has to, has to show solidarity and, and show that these choices have consequences. Minister Lavrov uh, was being broadcasted uh, and giving his version, uh, which is false, about what is happening in Ukraine. And so that's why we wanted to show a very strong stance uh, together. Today also, Canada uh, will petition the International Criminal Court of justice against Russia for crime against humanity and war crime. And it was also important for us to show um, that we're steadfast in terms of our support to Ukraine. In Russia itself, people took to the streets to voice their opposition to the war. Police have detained more than 2,000 people during anti-war protests. 
Well, this is where we say goodbye till next time. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelcv.com. Thank you so much for watching the program. I'm Tenyola Shaboale. Bye for now.